Hello everybody and welcome to Getting APIs to Work. Today we have James Higginbotham with us. Hey James, how are you doing? Hey Eric, doing great. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. We have James here with us because you wrote a book which is called The Principles of Web API Design. Congratulations. Thank you. And I think it's fair to say that it is in line with a number of other books that we've seen in that space by Michael Munson and by Arnaud Loré that try to take the API process wider than just looking at the technical aspects of the design, right? So give us a little bit of a motivation and overview of why you embarked on writing that book and then getting it published and all that stuff. It's a lot of work. So I'm sure that you have a good story to tell about that. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's actually a very interesting one. So I started doing a lot of API training with organizations along with uh, my training partner, and co-author of our previous book, uh, Keith Casey. He and I were going around uh, the US, uh, pretty much around North America, training on how to go from requirements to an API design. And in the process of doing that, we learned a lot, we captured it in a self-published book, and we used that training material for quite a while. But over the years, we uh, learned a lot more from it. And in particular, I kept taking that training a bit further and was being requested or seeing opportunities to kind of come a little bit before what we traditional think, traditionally think is API design and carrying it and making sure that teams are prepared to take that design into the delivery process so coding it up and deploying it into production. Uh, so this book really is taking a bit of a broader spectrum. It's taking those lessons learned from coaching teams on how to design APIs. Uh, it's taking lessons learned from the feedback that we received in training to determine how would, would you capture the design process in a systematic way that could be repeatable and taught easily in a workshop. And so that's where I really approach that from. So Vaughn Vernon and I had been talking over Twitter. He is well known in the domain driven design area. He's from or lived in Colorado for a time. So he came and visited me in Colorado Springs and we started talking about how we could you know, work together and then not long after that, I received an email saying, hey, I've got a new series with Addison Wesley, a signature series, uh, kind of in line with similar to the Martin Fowler series uh, mm -hmm. with his own uh, take on software architecture and domain driven design and kind of what he wanted to say in that series. So he has a series now and he invited me to talk about API design. So it's a great opportunity to bring all of those things together and capture them in a book which, as you said, is a lot of work, as you well know. So uh, it, it, it seemed like a, a worthy endeavor to try to capture all the lessons learned from being in the field training and coaching teams on design and bringing that all together into a, a printed copy. That is indeed a good story. Congratulations again. <laughs> it's great to see you know that book and that very uh, respectable series. So that, that's very good. And from what you've said, I think it's also interesting to look at, it's not just that we need to take the, the design process, let's say a little bit wider. Another thing that you were already mentioning that I think is also would be interesting to dive a little bit deeper into is the repeatability, right? There are all these studies of organizations, the one that I always quote, I think is from McKinsey, but there are a couple others I think around that say, all these digital transformations typically start pretty well in organizations because you have teams who are invested in it and people who feel really passionately about it. And then the scaling part typically is where things don't work quite as well, right? When you say, okay, we've done it one, two, three times, now just everybody do it. And that typically tends to be where things then don't work quite as great anymore. So. How do you think your contribution from the book then fits into that that problem, so to speak, problem space? Yeah, it, it, it's fascinating to uh, engage either in a consulting uh, role or in a workshop training role with organizations, because as you said, early, early on in their digital transformation, there are APIs that probably people have been thinking about for a while problems that have existed for a while, things that people say, boy, if I had another chance to do this over, I'd maybe mm -hmm. make these changes or approach it this way. And so there's always those passion projects or those kind of, I wouldn't say low hanging fruit from the idea that it's easy, but I would say people have put a lot of thought into it already. So when you get into the API design, the design 
sort of emerges pretty pretty easily or or easier than than others may then as you go deeper you're growing the program you're involving teams that haven't thought about what they do as an api or maybe they have an api internally that they use but they haven't thought about how would i design this so that someone less familiar with our systems could use an api to interact with us digitally as an organization or as a product that's where things get a lot more difficult so how do you take a a, a team that perhaps is uh, a team of of high performers that have thought about apis for a while that are on some high profile initiative and take what they've done with their api and repeat that and teach that to others that may not have had that opportunity yet and that's that's where this really came from it was the result of conducting workshops in organizations thousands and thousands of people that that Keith and I've taught over the years uh that have ownership of a particular part of the organization and they're trying to figure out how to step away from that curse of knowledge they know how their area works and to think about how do people interact with us how do we want to offer a digital set of capabilities or a digital front door to what we do as a product or organization that becomes more difficult and so that's what i really worked on heavily in the workshop was how do we take an approach that's repeatable that's trainable something i can train others to do so that they're comfortable doing it when i leave and also that they can teach others to conduct or facilitate their own uh workshops internally with other teams so that this becomes a repeatable process therefore creating a surface area or you know a landscape uh, as i know you've used before that landscape of apis how do we create consistency and think about how those apis not only are designed individually but also can you know participate in part of a an overall surface area or or landscape uh with all the other apis in the organization so that's that's really what i set out to do and i've done it somewhat already in the workshop and so this was now how do i capture all the techniques i demonstrate in a workshop in something that can stand on its own in a book and and provide sufficient guidance so someone can design an api using the techniques outlined in the book or can you know point this to someone else and and collaboratively do this with another team they may be responsible for uh huh that's that's a great story in terms of you know like having a wider perspective i think about what your apis are all about and um i would like to ask you something in that regard because one thing that i see a lot of in organizations is that they have a little bit i would say like a fractured approach at apis there's some section of the organization that is has done it for a while and they're pretty good at creating internal apis and then there is sometimes a completely disconnected other part of the organization where you have more people from the business side right who know about partner APIs and public APIs and they know how it can make their business better and more modern and they're working kind of on their API initiatives but these two teams sometimes really are very disjoint they do very different things they think they are doing entirely different things and then bringing them together to work on this consolidated API landscape can be pretty difficult. Yeah. So I'm wondering, have you experienced the same thing? And if so, what have you done to kind of bring those sides a little bit closer together? Yeah, I, I definitely see that. I see that frequently. In fact, most of the time, whenever I engage with organizations that are undergoing digital transformation, there's several aspects to it. Uh, there's the aspect of just teaching them how to design an API which is what the book covers but there's also kind of stepping back a little bit and using some of the techniques in the book on a broader scale so how can we uh you know collaborate and communicate uh across these different teams and maybe they're within the same functional domain area or maybe they span different areas and they're needing to figure out how to collaborate because a partner or their customer base is coming to them and saying no I don't want to just do this one thing I want to orchestrate this whole workflow this is what I'm trying to do mm -hmm. and that means internally the organization has to rethink how they collaborate they have to rethink how these different teams that they've 
you know, as Conway's law talks about, you know, designing software based on the organizational structure and, and how we've set these different reporting structures in place, how do we break some of those barriers down? So I do work with a lot of organizations doing that as well. Uh, so, so in the book, the design process is called Align, Define, Design, Refine, or ADDR. And that first part, Align, we can use that to align on a specific API design, or we can use that to align as across the organization. So are we uh-huh. thinking about our API surface area from an outside in perspective? And a lot of teams, they're really good at designing APIs that reflect how their systems work or how their internal operational structure works, their, their own internal workflows. But you and I as external consumers may not necessarily care about how they organize themselves internally and what their internal workflows are. We just care about what are the touch points or the interactions that I have with that organization or that product. And so I don't need to know all of those details. So sometimes we have to take that align step that would normally focus on just one single API design and kind of leverage those skills of thinking outside in and thinking about breaking Mm -hmm. down activities and business process decomposition or business process engineering techniques of breaking those things down and thinking about how does the market work with us? And, and so I've used this design technique, not only to design APIs, but to actually use the same kind of approach in a different way to take a breadth based view to help multiple teams come together in a collaborative session and figure out what those touch points are along that, that path or that workflow to produce the outcomes that partners want, the outcomes that customers want. And then you can come in and as you've identified those touch points, then use the ADDR process to dig deeper into designing each of the APIs that you need along the way. And you may figure out when you do an inventory, we already have some of these, but maybe they're designed for an internal use and we need to rethink them. Sometimes we might just need to make a bit of enhancement. We might already have some of the work already done. And so we can take an inventory, perform a gap analysis and figure out what that looks like. Then we can deep dive in to the design. So it takes a lot of communication and collaboration to get all the right subject matter experts together to figure out what those steps are, kind of lay out that overall landscape or portfolio, and then use the ADDR process to then to dig deep and really design those APIs again with an outside in perspective, but in a much more detailed manner where we're worried about, you know, the smaller discrete steps that someone might need to make digitally as they interact with our organization. Mm -hmm. That sounds very interesting. And I think I have you almost on the hook for another video that just is a deep dive on ADDR. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Very good. I'm looking forward to that one because I think it's really something that, that is very valuable. But today we, we just f- look at the book in, in, in its entirety, right? And mm-hmm. another thing that you have um, a little bit towards the end then is to say, and once you go through that process, you also end with different options, how you can design different ways, how like this general idea, what it is that you want to design then ends up being an actual API. And you, you support, so to speak, right, a variety of technologies, a variety of ways how people then may end, end up con- designing concrete APIs. So which ones are the technologies or the, the styles and technologies that you are covering in the book? Yeah, uh, so it definitely REST is covered. That's a, a very popular one um, when I'm working with organizations that tends to be the one that most organizations start with or have embarked upon already. So we cover REST. So what do I mean by REST? That just I'm looking at it from a resource-oriented perspective where we're leveraging HTTP specification to interact with different resources in different ways. Uh, I do cover a few different patterns in that area as well. So not only just the standard CRUD, the create, read, update, delete pattern we see with REST, but also functional style operations and long-running operations and, and things such as that. Uh, I also show how to take that that modeling effort that you undertake to figure out, as you said, that sketch of the API, not only to REST, but also to GraphQL. So we talk about how and when do you compose queries versus mutations, how to use them and how to translate that over into a design that delivers those digital capabilities using GraphQL. And then I also cover gRPC. So looking at it from an RPC perspective and leveraging gRPC. Now, 
in the book, we also really step back and take a, a bit of a higher level overview. And we talk not only about REST, but about RPC style APIs, when we would use them and when we wouldn't. So that if the, the reader is going through and they've arrived at a high level API profile that kind of defines what their API needs to do, but they haven't figured out what style or maybe multiple styles they need to use to leverage to deliver what they need for their audience uh, to solve the problems at hand, uh, they can have some guidance in there as well. So should I use gRPC? Um, well, let's talk about RPC and how it's used. Let's talk about the advantages of gRPC. We touch on that. We do the same thing with GraphQL. And I actually even mentioned OData in there a little bit. Now, OData is not ah. as popular, but it is another query style. And some those that use Microsoft tooling may be looking at that or, or maybe wanting to take a look at the Microsoft Graph APIs that exist and having a little bit of that background on where Microsoft came from and from in, in helping to design OData helps as well. So it's about designing what the API or, or modeling what the API needs to have, what operations it needs to have, and then manifesting it with REST, with GraphQL, with gRPC. And it also prepares the reader for any new API styles that come up because now we've learned how to reason about and think about the trade-offs as a good architect would do. Mm -hmm. And so we can start considering new things that emerge as well and figure out how does that fit in and when might I use that and start thinking about those decisions rather than just going with the the automatic REST or yeah. GraphQL or gRPC arguments that come up. Let's understand the pros and cons and, and make an informed decision instead of arguing about which one's right, and which one's wrong. Uh, oftentimes it's an and not an or discussion anyway. So understanding that's really important. So that's covered in the book as well. And then async APIs also. So we talk a bit about oh. when do we, yeah, when, when do we not want to just have request response, but also things like web hooks and web sockets and when those fit in, in and also because gRPC has bi-directional communication, we need to understand a little bit about async. When we do we use that? When are we notificate, notifying uh, consumers of events uh, via callbacks? And when are we doing push notifications? And how do we make some of those decisions as well? And then how do we document it and so on? So there's a little bit of everything in there to cover a lot of the situations that, that teams will encounter when they're designing APIs. From what you just said, it seemed to me that you're claiming there is no single best technology to do APIs. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I was that is disappointing. Yeah. Yeah. There's not just one, one that solves everything. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's, I was involved in the early days of Java back in 95, 96, when Java first came out and then .NET came out. And so there was always discussions, which one's better. And those were not very fruitful conversations or debates. You know, <laughs> it's, it's because no one wanted to talk about what, what the problem was to figure out what the solution would be and, you know, what's the best fit for it. Uh, and likewise, we need to do the same thing with our APIs. You know, we need to think about what the context is, what the, who the developer is that's using the API, what kind of devices are they using, what kind of interaction models do we have? Are we doing request response, sync or async? You know, we've, we've got a lot of those decisions to make. And so we have to kind of weigh those things out and, uh, and, and not every solution is, is a best fit. So, there's, there's some opportunities there to, to think about and. and. And a lot of times what I'll see is organizations will start with REST uh, for whatever reason. They've, they've defined that as their, their starting point in their foundation and maybe 80% of their APIs are that, but they may mix in some GraphQL to give them a little bit more capabilities for ad hoc queries or response shaping to get exactly what the consumer needs because they have bandwidth concerns or, or other kinds of concerns that the device may need to consider. And, you know, GraphQL might solve some of that problem. And, and likewise, gRPC is oftentimes used within data centers, and but maybe not as great from a web browser. So there's all kinds of trade-offs to think about. So we talk about that in the book heavily so that the, the reader is equipped to make an informed decision. Or if there's been certain decisions already made, then they can understand maybe why those decisions were made. Mm -hmm. From your experience, I'm just wondering, what do you see in organizations? Like you said, right? Oftentimes they start out with a certain technology just because, well, that's how whoever started this thing got, got started in the organization. And then they start realizing, oh, there's different 
technologies that might be better fit sometime for certain classes of problems. How do you see that developing? Are, are you still seeing a lot of organizations going more the we do everything with one thing or are they now branching out into everything or a more disciplined it's like we do those two things? What's what what are the trends you're seeing? Uh, most of the organizations that I encounter, even when I first start engaging, they already have multiple API styles. The challenge that most of them have is making the decision of when and why to choose a particular <laughs> one. And so as we start to either, you know, incubate an API program and maybe a center of excellence or center for enablement, C4E, you know, however the organization prefers to, to think about it. Uh, that API program, as it starts to incubate or starts to mature, oftentimes is asked by teams, what should we do? And, and it's fascinating because API, I've always said API intersects product thinking, concerns about the business or business value and technology or software architecture. So it means that that API program team, that, that group, that center of excellence or center for enablement, is really responsible for helping teams navigate some architectural decisions, even though they may or may not organizationally fall underneath an architectural area or an enterprise architecture yeah. governance team. So, so they're always making recommendations. So what, what I've always found that's, that's, that's always challenging is that teams want to know or want to be given a decision matrix. They wanna know they're making the right decision. No, oh, yeah. They don't Matrixes necessarily want great. to be told. Yes. Yeah, they are. Then they're very helpful because they help us take the context that we have as a team and apply it to some simple questions that kind of help us narrow down our decision. They don't want to get stuck in analysis paralysis. They don't want to be stuck for weeks or months debating on an API style. And they want to feel confident that the one that they've started off with is the one that's the best fit so that they don't have to rewrite code or redo a lot of code. So, so organizations years ago oftentimes defaulted and said they made a decision and at the time it was probably REST and before that it was SOAP and before that it was CORBA. And you know they've always said, this is what we're gonna do because we don't wanna have to worry about making a bunch of decisions and supporting a, different, a bunch of different styles or libraries or integration problems. But now what they're realizing is there's not just one. And we are going to have multiple, just like we have multiple programming languages. And within those, sometimes multiple frameworks that we use to build APIs, to build web you know, backends, uh, whatever it is, client side frameworks, server side frameworks and all that. We are going to have to have multiple API styles. So they'll oftentimes say, use this as your default. Here's when these other styles are really beneficial this will allow you to leverage the hard work that's been put in code generators helper libraries ci cd infrastructure testing infrastructure all the things that you leverage every day these are the things that you can use to help accelerate you here are the things where it makes sense to deviate and maybe go a different direction but still get to leverage some of those libraries and it makes sense in the end to help teams so that they can just they're going down their list of things they got to think about and check off. And it's like, what API style do I need for this API? Check, got that figured out. Now I can figure out which language, which yeah. framework, what do I need to move on? And the, the ADDR process in the book kind of guides you through how do you do the API design, figure out and have an informed high level design, and then you can make that decision, deferring that decision until you know a little bit more and still be able to take the work you've done in the initial design processes and apply that to whatever API style mm -hmm. or styles you need so that we don't waste time, we don't hold up the process, and we can make the best informed we decision we can as we've learned more about what kind of API we're designing, and then we can apply that design. So it, it, it makes sense for a lot of organizations to have those kinds of guidelines so that teams feel confident that they're going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that is a, sounds like something that really pretty much any organization would want to have in place in particular with more and more and it, it's just a combinatorial thing right more and if the more teams you have who are being held up by these kind of considerations right the more time is getting wasted and as we all know right there are more and more API teams who are trying to get stuff done so the more you can enable them, enable them the better. Absolutely. One thing I would like to ask is, I mean, I think your book right now really covers a nice 
a nicely wide spectrum of what it takes nowadays to, to get from the idea of having an API to having something that you can then implement. My question is, if you now got one bonus year where you can write another book, where is there another like interesting, you know, slice of problems and in an in interesting area where you would say, yeah, that part actually is also is very interesting. I would like to investigate that more and there's probably something to be said there. What would that be? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm torturing myself with the idea of maybe going down and writing another book, sitting down and writing another one and going down that path. Uh, and so in that case, it's really, I think, about API programs. So I think there's a lot that's been written about how to build uh, with code there, that world changes a lot. You need videos, you need tutorials, you need the latest guidelines docs for the latest version of the latest framework that helps you build the latest API. All of that stuff is, is, is very important. And, but I think has a lot of coverage already. What hasn't been written about a lot and what I'm seeing and, and what I do with my consulting engagements is to help people go figure out what they need to do with their API program. Uh, the, the, the CAM book that you've written, the continuous API management book that you've written along with some of your other fellow co-authors, they, you've covered a lot of those decisions and, and kind of the, the, the things that organizations need to think about. Uh, I would love to almost pick up from that and bridge between the book that you've written and the book that I just finished writing about API design and talk about how do you stand up a COE or C for E. Um, what elements are important for a style guide? Um, what things do you need to consider? Do you do design reviews? Do you organize in a centralized, federated, or completely distributed way? I work with a lot of organizations in those areas, and there's a lot of opportunity to really expand where you, you took the, the CAM book and where we're at today talking about coding and designing and everything else too. How do we scale? How do we... How do we help teams be autonomous in this world where, as you said, every team's got to get an API out the door uh, and there's lots of APIs being built today. And then the CIOs, the CTOs and the directors that are all trying to figure out how do I take what I'm doing today or what this one team is doing well and multiply that out? Um, how do I stand up an, an API coaching program so that we can help other teams become more self-sufficient in a repeatable way? How do you certify or figure out how, who's qualified to be an API coach? Are they properly representing your, your COE or C4E? So as you can tell, I've got a lot of thoughts around that because that's what I it deal with day like in it. and day out. And, uh, and, and, and I don't know if that in and of itself can be a book because there's a lot of decisions that have to be made and a lot of, well, if you're this kind of business, then you might want to look at this one. But I think if I could get it distilled down, that's probably where I would go next. And it would be a great compliment to this, this book that I've, that I've written on, on API design, because now it helps you think about the things beforehand. How do you equip product owners, product managers to be prepared to own an API and all those other elements that go into it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think you should really do that. That is an excellent idea. And, and like you said, what you have covered before, right? Like the individual APIs, that is something that at least there is quite a bit of stuff out there, different areas of coverage, let's say, but at least how, how do I get from an API idea to an API? I think that is something that has been said many times. The other level, right? The landscape level, I think that really is where you see, you see a lot of organizations, let's say, still having potential. That's how I like to say it. And anybody who can give them some guidance how to realize all of that potential, right? I think that would be extremely valuable. So I think you should definitely do that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll I'll uh, I'll start jumping on it right away. <laughs> right. No, away. Seriously, okay. I, I okay. actually. Then let's get actually, finished here, and then you. Stick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just take just take the video. We'll transcribe it. We'll turn it into a book. Um, no, it's it's. I've got an outline kind of started already because it's it's nice. it's one of those things that's mulling around. I'm trying to think, you know, how to how do you do that? Because it's it's definitely a need, as you said. I, I like to think of organizations in different stages of their journey, their digital transformation journey, their API program journey. They may be formalizing their API program, or they may still be informal, 
or they might be pretty far along. There's quite a few companies that, you know, have, have gone pretty far, but oh, now yeah. they're, they're, they've encountered some other kind of challenges. And so they, they could benefit from that as well. So there's, there's a lot, a lot to be said for it. Uh, a lot more than I think a lot of people think about when they think about APIs, they just think about the, the paths and the HTTP methods and the response codes and the, the, the GraphQL queries and, and those kinds of elements. And, and there's a lot more around the, the people side of it, the management, the ownership, the life cycle elements that are really important. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And then, Right. We, we see all these reports saying that scaling API programs is, is where a lot of organizations are struggling. So mm -hmm. I think whatever helps with that is definitely would be a very valuable piece of work. I think that wraps it up very nicely, James. I'd like to thank you very much for being here. Yeah, and, thanks, Eric, um, for having me here. Appreciate it. It's great to chat with you. Yeah. And I... Thanks again for just walking us through the book. And next up, we will have a deeper dive at um, your the process, the ADDR process. I think that also will be very interesting. But for now, thanks again for being here. If you like this video, everybody, please give it a thumbs up. And until next time, see you around. Bye bye.